but yeah, let's get started. Today's deep dive is on investment selection inside PPLI and PPVA. Um, and I, we've got a couple of esteemed guests here, Dave Reynolds with Spearhead Administrative Services and Kevin Murphy with Provenio Capital. Uh, what's what's the official, I mean, it's Provenio, but you guys, Capital Management, what, what's, what's your official uh, company title or name? Uh, well, per, yeah, per, Provenio Capital. Provenio, Provenio Capital. Capital Management, Inc. And, you know, okay. There's a few entities. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So why don't you guys, before I share my screen and, and we all become these little, uh, you know, boxes on the uh, on the website here or on the on the Zoom, you guys give uh, folks a quick introduction as to who you are and um, uh, yeah, your your role on, on on today's call. So Dave, I'll start with you. Sure. Thanks, Ben. Um, my name is Dave Reynolds. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Spearhead Administrative Services. So we're an approved third party administrator that partners with asset managers and RIAs, as well as the various insurance companies in the private placements marketplace. And we assist the RIA or asset manager to effectively lift up how they manage either fund structures or custom portfolios on a traditional basis for clients, and then drop that within the confines of PPLI and PPVA. So think of us as the, the hand surgeon that, that helps RIAs and asset managers to enter into and then manage manage either fund structures or custom accounts in this good place. So if, if an asset manager wants to manage money inside a PPLI or PPVA platform on a custom basis, they've got to use you guys or there's one other administrator in the market. Is that right? Yeah. So we have a, we have a turnkey process for creating okay. either an IDF or an SMA program. And then we can, we can consult with the investment manager and help them determine the appropriate appropriate approach and, you know, deliverable, depending on what they're looking to achieve for their clients. Got it. Got it. Kevin? Yeah. Once again, thanks for uh, having us join here. So um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Provenio Capital. We started the company about uh, seven and a half, eight years ago. I've got a partner, Ben Durant. Uh, he was a former CIO for a single family office in L.A., um, I had a little bit more background in the financial planning and the insurance business. So I convinced him to kind of move over to the dark side and become an entrepreneur. And we did that seven and a half years ago. And we had some um, some seed capital. Um, I think we started with about 80, 80 million. Um, we've got uh, about 40 families that we work we work for. Um, at about 1.7 billion now today. Um, and as part of that 1.7 billion, there's about 185 million that's being managed inside our insurance dedicated fund and, and more so uh, via SMAs, um, you know, via PPVA or PPLI. And I think, you know, our approach is a little bit, I think different than your traditional RIA where we focus primarily on alternative strategies. Um, and as we all know, uh, there's a lot of alternative strategies. I mean, it's a wide spectrum, but, you know, we look at it as kind of the left side and the right side of the barbell, where the left side of the barbell is, I'd say, more predictable cash flowing um, type strategies like private credit, real estate debt. Uh, we've got large allocations in real asset leasing strategies, rail cars, tugboats, barges. Um, and then as you kind of work your way over the right side of the barbell, it's a little bit more dynamic with, you know, venture capital of, of all stages um, and, and, and private equity. Um, we don't have much public equity exposure and very limited um, muni exposure as well. So, you know, what we're looking for are smaller, you know, more niche, you know, capacity constrained type strategies. Yeah. Um, and uh yeah, so you know, obviously, we work with Spearhead and um, and and Ben, and uh, are looking forward to uh, doing more stuff with them as well. Awesome. Well, let's jump in. We've got a, a slide deck here, as we, as we typically do, just to kind of guide our conversation. So I'm going to share my screen here, and and the reason we have both uh, Dave and Kevin on the call is again. A lot of our advisors we work with, you guys hear from us a lot, right? And you hear our perspective on things, but we thought bringing people in that they're actually doing things that we don't do uh, would be beneficial to your understanding of PPLI, PPVA, and how how it actually works. I mean, reason I wanted Kevin on was for you guys to hear from Kevin of like, 
for those of you who haven't done it, like, yeah, what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the things they like, they don't like, whatever, uh, from an investment manager's perspective? And then, you know, Dave, there's some of you on the call that, again, haven't implemented PPLI or if you're curious about the plumbing, so to speak, how does it actually work behind the scenes? What, what's actually going on? That's where Dave and his team uh, step in and can, can really uh, provide some insight and some valuable wisdom there. So uh, we've hit the intros. Uh, Frank, you want to, uh, let's see if I can make this thing go. There we go. You want to talk uh, talk through previous deep dives and then our conversation roadmap. Yep, exactly. So thanks, Ben. Uh, hopefully someone will come and rescue me from uh, my brother and sister-in-law's uh, basement at some point. <laughs> but for now, I'm very happy to be here. And, and before we begin, I mean, I really... This particular deep dive is probably more similar to the conversations I think that Ben and I have when we're speaking to RIAs, right? Of like, what do they want to know and how do they go about implementing? And just like Ben said, right, what what are, are there pitfalls? How does it look different from my normal business, you know, every day or does it? Um, so we've done uh, several deep dives before. Uh, you can go to our website. Go to there's a QR code for uh, deep dive one, which is repurposing existing life insurance, and deep dive two, maximizing charitable and financial objectives with PPVA. Today we're really going to talk about. I, this is really primarily from the perspective of the wealth manager. So we're going to talk about investor control rules relating to SMAs. IDFs, the use of IDFs in SMA programs, but then right, let's even take a, a higher level view. What are insurance dedicated funds? Kevin already referred to the fact that his firm has both an IDF and an SMA program. What, what's behind those choices? Why does someone, you know, one particular firm go one route versus another route or combining the two? Uh, when we get talk about separately managed accounts, who qualifies, what are the requ funding requirements to get both the program off the ground, as well as once it's off the ground, various carriers are going to have different requirements depending on what program you adopt and those funding requirements. Um, we're going to talk about from a wealth manager's perspective, right? What does onboarding look like? What is custody of the, those assets? Again, investor control rules relative to IDFs, SMAs, the different reporting requirements as it relates to investor control rules, and then what type of investments are, and Kevin's already referred to this, what, what type of investments are we seeing within these structures? Uh, and then Dave is really going to talk about the role of the administrator. How are they helping out RIAs? Uh, wealth managers, trust companies, um, what's their role in the investor control diversification rules, their fee structure. Um, and then, of course, we're going to open up to a Q&A. But as we say every time, please put your questions into the chat. Let's try to make this as interactive and in real time. So when we're talking, you can ask the question that you want to ask. Awesome. All right. So we're, we we developed uh, to to get started. We developed just a little flow chart here for everyone to kind of better understand the flow of funds inside a PPLI contract. And obviously, this is particularly important as we think about the investment piece, right? Like when we fund a policy, where's the money go? What's happening to it, and all that. So obviously, when we start, we're going to make a premium payment to an insurance company, who then is going to deposit those funds in a separate account. And for purposes of this discussion, again, that can look like either an IDF or an SMA, or again, a combination of those two things. And we're going to unpack what those are here in a minute. Um, one of the key things, and we were talking, um, I was talking yesterday with, a, uh, with an investment manager around the separate account status of PPLI. And again, one key distinction here, when we look at PPLI, as with all variable products, they are separate account products. And by that, what we mean is the account values are not subject to the general creditors and claims of the insurance company. So your counterparty risk from a, you know, from a fiduciary perspective, you know, is my clients or are my clients funds at risk? Should the carrier go bankrupt, a Prudential, a Lombard, an investors preferred, you know, you name it. You know, are we worried about the financial security? Because when we look many years out in the, in the future, these account values get very large, especially when we're talking 20, 30, $40 million dollar 
policies of premium, right? And so the fact that they are separate account products completely outside of the uh, the balance sheet or off the balance sheet of the carrier, that's really important. So they flow into the investment account. At that point, again, most of our policies that we run here at WealthPoint, we're working with the RIA. I think we've done one policy maybe, uh, in fact, yeah, one policy that does not have an RIA, a bank, a trust company, multifamily office, whatever, who is managing those, those funds. And so we'll appoint through the carrier them to, so in this case, it might be Kevin on the call to run those, to run those funds, those investment selection for, uh, for the owner of the, uh, for the owner of the account. And actually the way the account is titled and, and Dave, you actually might be able to speak more, more specifically to this, but the, the insurance company is actually the owner of this, uh, of this separate account, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So they're actually the owner. And so they're the ones uh, appointing at the direction of the policy owner. They're the ones that are, that are appointing in this particular example, Kevin and Prevenio to manage the money, correct? Exactly. So in the case of a separate managed account, the insurance insurance company would open a custody account at Schwab or Fidelity in the name of that segregated account of the insurance contract. And then Kevin would be selected as a discretionary sub-advisor on that account. Yeah, got it. And they could have multiple SMAs, right? I mean, they could, let's say there's a $10 million account. They could say, hey, I'm going to point Kevin to run seven of them. I want three going to whoever else or whatever. Exactly. Any approved IDF is available to them offered by the carrier or an SMA program that's been approved by the carrier. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. So flow funds that way. Then what we see here coming out of this account, in addition to the advisory fees that are being paid to the manager of the account, we've got the monthly cost of insurance charges and m and &E fees as well. So that's kind of a bundled charge there you see. And again, that's just a monthly deduction that gets paid back to the insurance company. The carrier or the owner then has access to any, uh, any funds sitting inside the account. We talk about this a lot. Access to funds is really critical. And so again, flow funds can come back to the policy owner via a withdrawal to basis or a loan against the policy's cash value and death benefit. And then lastly, when the insured finally uh, perishes, uh, the death benefit is paid out to their chosen beneficiary. It could be a trust, multiple trusts uh, to their estate. Again, if they own it in their estate or whatever else. So uh, we hope this is kind of helpful in you guys understanding flow of funds, uh, where the money goes, who gets paid, what, where, why, and then again, who's responsible for what. Anything you'd add there, Frank, uh, Kevin, or Dave? No, I think that was pretty good then. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Frank, you want to tackle uh, investor control and diversification with the help of our friends, uh, Dave and Kevin? Yeah. So uh, this is, there, there really are two primary rules that govern private placement structures, both PPLI and PPVA. So one is investor control. And this is, I, I think I'm safe to say, Dave and Kevin, you would agree, investor control is the big one here. Uh, the diversification test is pretty easy to, uh, to to satisfy. But in investor control, the policy owner may not exercise direct or indirect influence over a fund manager and investment advisor selection of funds or securities. Basically, the client, um, the trustee, anybody associated with the policy has to give Kevin or someone in Kevin's position full discretion over the investments. They cannot say to Kevin, Kevin, I want you to buy Apple today and sell Google and then take the proceeds and go do that tugboat thing you were talking about, right? So these are full discretion, uh, discretionary accounts on behalf of the money manager. Uh, there is a you know, seminal case out there called Weber. I believe it was 2017. So if anybody wants to go read about how not to do something, uh, go read the Weber case. But this is really... Uh, I would say when PPLI doesn't work, in my experience, it's because of the investor control issue, because that particular client needs their hands on the wheels of every investment decision. And if you have a client like that, this may not be appropriate. Uh, diversification is pretty easy to satisfy. Um, one investment can't be more than 55%, two more than 70, three more than 80, and four more than 90. So we are going to need five distinct um, different uh, assets inside an SMA program. 
you know, one question here, Dave. So we, someone sets up a program and they're fully in compliance with diversification from day one. But over the course of that year or subsequent years, they don't really change their allocation, but one investment simply outperforms. And that investment that originally started at 50% of the, of the total assets is now 70%. What happens in that case? So an investment manager will never be penalized for having a single investment that outperforms or underperforms and you know cuts off that, that balance of diversification. Now, in practice, they're probably going to want to rebalance that allocation. So there's some level of diversification just for the portfolio overall. Uh, but there's no penalty if you know if if an investment just through its normal performance or or a course of being invested you know, breaks that diversification. But then if the investment advisor goes to rebalance the portfolio, and if that one asset is now organically 75% in that rebalancing, they are going to have to get within the diversification rules once they take a proactive step. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's our recommendation. Best practice. Okay. Kevin, is there any have you had issues in terms of making sure clients are educated about investor control? They understand what is that conversation typically like? Yeah, you know, Frank, I think that you alluded to it. I think if there's risk to the structure or the strategy, it's, in my opinion, it's probably more driven around investor control. And, you know, especially, you know, our business, right, where we, most of our business is non-discretionary. And then, you know, obviously the the SMAs are discretionary, right? So we've got to draw a line in the sand and we're very clear with our clients, you know, where we're talking more big picture about asset classes, you know, and obviously having conversation around um, strategies within say private credit, as I mentioned earlier, that are relatively tax inefficient. And so there's discussion around structure, but more so at a high level, but as it relates to, um, you know, us having discretion, we're ultimately making those decisions. So very cautious around, you know, email traffic um, and, you know, making it very clear up front that we don't want to pierce that investor control. Yeah. Um, as, as, you, as you guys said, diversification, you know, we've had a few incidences with Lombard where, you know, they'll, they'll come to the table and say, you know, you had a, you had a manager that's been performing very well and, you know, we've got to get diversification kind of back in check. Um, and our ops team, you know, works, works well with, with, uh, with the administrator and, and the companies. Yeah. I, I mean, we could obviously spend a, a, a long time just, just on this page. And, and I think we're going to touch upon this later in, in the slides, but I'm sure one question people may have is, okay, great. I'm going to give Kevin total discretion. How does Kevin know what I want to actually generally invest in, what my risk tolerance is? Dave, can you talk a little bit about what an investor policy statement is briefly, how often it could be changed? What, what's the detail level and something like that? Sure, Frank. So each SMA is, is assigned an investment policy statement, which essentially sets the guardrails for how the investment advisor can manage those monies. And typically those guardrails are set very wide so that there's the investment manager is allowed to be dynamic change the allocation over time, as long as they stay within those guardrails and and invest in asset classes or strategies, you know, defined in that IPS, then, you know, that'll remain in compliance. Likewise, the IPS can be customized on a client by client basis. So, you know, maybe the investment themes that one client desires are different than, you know, what client B desires, or maybe Prevenio, you know, is going to charge a certain fee on one SMA versus another. Likewise, that can be defined in the IPS. And so as the RIA, you may have a single IPS that you use for all of your clients, or you might have 10 different IPSs if you have you know, varying client needs by SMA. Right. And the IPS can be changed by that client. It's not yep. set in stone. Over time, if the client's you know, investment attitudes change, we can always swap out one IPS for another with the insurance company. That's a straightforward process. Okay. Well, Ben, anything uh, else to add? I mean, I know that this is can be a very deep topic in and of itself, but I know in the uh, thinking about the time and other topics we need to cover. Um, 
No, I, I think this is a good discussion. It's it's the one place you can screw it up. So we don't want to make light of it. At the same time, it's, uh, you know, it's something that's easily managed uh, with the right team. It's kind of what we say, right? Um, so make sure you're surrounded by good people, a good administrator, a good asset manager, a good IPS. And then again, uh, all those kind of working together uh, can keep you uh, keep your nose clean, so to speak. And again, if, if there are further questions as we continue on here, Again, just drop them in the chat. We're happy to answer. But we are going to touch on you know, investor control as it relates to IDFs, which is our next topic here, and as it relates to SMAs, because I think it's a little um, – with IDFs, it's very straightforward. And, and for the absence of, uh, you know, of any presumption here, or, well, whatever that means, you know, we don't want to presume people know exactly what an IDF is. So that's what this graphic is meant to represent, is to say, all right – you know, an IDF functionally is a prepackaged or you know pre-approved fund that the insurance company offers to policy owners, and so for for many years this was kind of the go-to way of implementing PPLI. So a client would buy a large policy, they put a bunch of money in, and they would then go to the carrier and say, "Hey, what are your lists of approved funds?" They were fund of funds, VC funds, maybe some hedge funds, whatever it is. And they would say, all right. And, and then their investment team would go do all the due diligence, the research and say, well, I like this fund. I like that fund. We don't like these. Um, and and it, it worked. But I think what we've seen over time is kind of the combination of the SMA where, again, you have custom asset management with some of the IDFs that, that, that fit together. It's really kind of the, the way, you know, a lot of our PPLI policies are being managed today. So, you see there, insurance carrier sends money to the separate account, which then gets invested in IDF. The IDF is going to have at least five positions, so it satisfies that diversification test right out of the gate. And also, IDFs are deemed to be free from investor control just by their definition from the from the IRS. And so a, a, a policy owner, so if your client buys a policy and says, I want to invest in Kevin's IDF, that does not violate investor control. Correct, Dave? Just make sure I'm good on that. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, I think just to add to that, you know, you can you could have the IDF and you know ultimately put that in an SMA. And there's a there's a look through for diversification purposes. So you don't need an additional five managers. So we could have our IDF and we could have, you know one or two or three other strategies. You don't ultimately have to have five other strategies to solve for uh, the diversification, which is a little bit unique. So, so our IDF has, I think, probably, I think it roughly has about 12 managers in there. Um, you know, when we started doing this five, six years ago, we started out with the IDF and it was predominantly a couple, a couple families, um, you know, it sits on Pacific Life's platform. It sits on uh, Lombard's platform and Prudential's platform. But with the adoption of the SMA, which I know we'll get into a, a little bit later, it's just it's given us a lot more flexibility, um, concentration. And so, you know, if you were to give the choice to the client between an IDF and an SMA, I would say the larger clients are leading towards the separately managed accounts naturally. Yeah. Any additions to that, Dave? Now, the SMA just offers, it, it provides a lot more flexibility to the advisor, as yeah. Kevin alluded to, especially for like ultra wealthy families and clients. They they're tend to receiving more bespoke solutions. And so the SMA construct really allows for that. It also allows for like customization, how the RA charges their fee through the contract. Um, so just a much more bespoke, much more, I would argue, RIA friendly solution that kind of blends with how they're accustomed to engaging with clients on a traditional taxable basis. Yeah. So, so why would, and, and Kevin, perhaps this, this is also a, a question for you because my guess is the IDF came before the SMAs uh, at your firm. Um, why would a, a wealth manager, knowing that the SMA really can be so customized, why do some continue to prefer creating an IDF? Is it because they've got a, hey, they've got a, a particular strategy in mind with a particular focus and expertise? It's an ease of doing business. What what would be the motivation from the perspective of the wealth manager? Yeah, it's a good question, Frank. And I I kind of I smile when you ask that because I go back and forth with Jeremy in our office who runs our our investment operations and. 
if it was his choice, he would he would close the IDF and we would just do all SMAs. And I'll tell you, it's we've learned a lot with the insurance dedicated fund. I mean, our our insurance dedicated fund has very little equity exposure. Um, you know, and I think I think it's probably in the best position that it's been in. And, you know, so and and, and candidly, it's helpful for smaller investors. You know, so if you've got a client that's got a PPLI policy and they want to put in five hundred thousand dollars a year for five years, that can go in the IDF. You know, so um, administratively, it's 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 light. Um, you know, and I, I think that most I, I say most families are leading towards the SMA. So so if we're sitting here five years from now, is there a chance that the IDF doesn't exist? There's a chance, but then there's a competitive side of it as well, where, you know, we're, we're actually proud of it, you know, and want to have good performance. And, um, you know, I think there's out of the 180 and change, I think there's roughly 40 in the IDF, just to kind of put things into perspective. Got it. So hopefully that answers your question. I mean, it's, most of what we've done, other than existing clients that are in the IDF, like just having grown up in the insurance business, like, you know, I had some 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 of my pals set up PPLI plans and they were putting in 250 a year for five years. So that was perfect for the IDF. Yep. You know, an SMA, I would say, you know, Dave, and you're you can speak to this better. Our our, our kind of minimum with SMAs are are, are five million to really make it work. That's what we see with the majority of the carriers, bespoke SMA, 5 million or more committed premiums. Um, You know, the benefit of the IDF is that, you know, the RAA, let's let's say they have a constellation of clients that all desire a similar investment mandate. You can achieve some scale through the IDF and build out a diversified portfolio. So maybe the IDF only has 10 or 20 million bucks in it, but you can build an allocation across 10 different managers, which in an individual 500,000 or million dollar policy, you're just not able to achieve that. Yep. All right. So um, kind of to round this out, when we think of IDFs, we typically think about kind of the alternative investment universe, right? So these are the the hedge funds, the fund of funds, things like that. Uh, For your benefit on the call, we're going to, one, we're recording all this. uh, As most of you know, you'll get a copy of this along with a slide deck after this. But in the slide deck, all the way at the end, uh, we have links to all the current offerings from each of the carriers. So you can actually see the actual funds that they they offer, both on the alternative side. Um, So those would be, you know, your your marquee names, your your Gala, Millennium, Bain, Apollo, uh, Golden Tree, Blue Owl, you name it. They've got some great funds. Uh, But there's also the the Variable Insurance Trust, which are just your routine run of the mill you know, your Vanguard, and we've got, you know, some of those names that you guys would recognize here, right? Um, so these are traditional asset classes, balanced portfolios, mutual funds, ETFs, things like that. So uh, th- there are significant offerings without you having to go out and create a whole SMA, right? Um, or, or ways to augment your SMA, if, if in fact, that's what you want to do. If you're doing an SMA, you probably won't do any of these traditional assets, your VITs, um, but you could if you wanted to. Um, here's some other, you know, again, some some common names that some of you on the on the call would recognize in terms of uh, the the alts restic- restricted liquidity um things like that all right on to the sma so how does an sma differ from an idf um it looks like the same here on the flow chart but dave maybe you want to talk a little bit about from a structuring perspective i think we've kind of alluded to it a lot of the folks in our call already know this but but for the benefit of those who don't, and, and for those that will watch this later, why don't you talk a little bit about that SMA and the difference in the IDF? Sure. Um, so at Spearhead, we we partner with RAs and asset managers to build both SMAs and IDFs. And when we work with a, an RA to build an SMA program, there's, there's initial build up front that we complete with them after they've identified the initial client opportunity. So we'll build their program and then we'll submit it to one or more insurance carriers for approval and onboarding. And then once that's complete, it's, you know, it's in place. And then the RIA can you know, leverage their SMA program for future client opportunities. Um, the SMA itself really looks and feels similar to any other traditional like taxable account that the RIA oversees. So 
we can use the you know, leverage the RAs, you know, existing custodial relationship, whether it's a Charles Schwab or Fidelity or you know other custodian, and open a name, open a, a policy account with the carrier on behalf of that particular client's you know policy segregated account, and then and then we can assign either either the advisors. Schwab SL master number or Fidelity G number to that account. So likewise, from where the advisor sits, they can see this account on a daily basis. They have investment discretion to pick and choose, you know, any liquid market securities that they normally allocate to. So stocks, bonds, ETFs, treasuries, you name it. And then likewise, to the extent that they allocate to alternative investments, they then work with us as the administrator. And then we re review and effectuate those investments with the insurance carrier on behalf of the SMA. And all that, all that investment reporting ties back to that account. So the RIA has, has you know, daily look through access to that and can you know, track the value of each portfolio. And from an operational standpoint, yep. you know, our ops teams loves it, right? Because most of what we do, as I mentioned earlier, are alternative strategies, which are essentially limited partnerships, you know, other than some of these interval funds. So there's a fair amount of paperwork and sub docs and uh, Dave and, and his team uh, get the luxury of uh, handling those sub docs. That's right. So, so, uh, so you can just like, say Dave's your secretary. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to say that, or I'm not going to. He's, get he's your executive that. admin. That's, that's the more PC term of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just don't ask me to grab me a cup of coffee. <laughs> Kevin, and, and, that Go, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, and just to add to that too, I mean, it's you know, there's alternatives are, are complex. You know, they've they, there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of K ones. You know, I, I think that's another huge advantage. I mean, we've got clients that you know might have a hundred K ones, right? And so if we can minimize their, you know, their their K one friction within an SMA, you know, people actually like that. You know, on top of you, you know, saving them, saving them a bunch of a bunch of taxes. Right. I mean, so, Kevin, you just referred to, uh, you know, talking about Dave being your secretary and taking care of paperwork. Right. So I think that's an important part. And we're going to talk about uh, that later in the presentation. But just so everybody's clear, the client is not actually signing those limited partnerships paperwork. Correct, Dave? That's correct. It's the insurance company. So Kevin and his team, when they when they desire a private investment, they'll submit instruction to Spearhead as it relates to insurance company, policy number, investment amount. They'll also send us a copy of the PPM, LPA, and subdocs for that investment. And then we'll review the investment, not to opine whether it's a good or bad investment because we're in, indifferent. Although I'm told Kevin and his team only pick good investments. Um, and and so we'll review that, ensure that the investment fits within that original investment policy statement, and then we'll send that to the insurance company. They likewise will do their own independent review, and then ultimately they'll sign off on that investment. And then completion of subdocs is is completed between the administrator and the insurance company, and then those subdocs and those those funding amounts are then sent to that investment manager. Right. And then, and again, Kevin also made, made reference to what I think is, you know, an undervalued great point is there's no K-1s associated with any of this, correct? That's right. All, K, all K-1s are sent to the insurance company and the insurance company has no obligation as technical owner of that investment to share with a policy owner. And, and I think just to kind of add for the other RAs on the phone, we're on the call here, um, you know, there is a process to getting approved to be on the platform, you know, I, and Dave could probably speak to it, you know, where we were five years ago, just with our AUM, you know, the, 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 the length of time we were, we were in business, you know, albeit had it been in prior businesses, but I think, I think Allborn did their due diligence on our firm. It was pretty, pretty strenuous via Prudential. And there, I think, our second year in the business, Prudential did not approve us, uh, you know, as either for IDF or SMA. And so maybe, Dave, you can talk to talk about that, how you guys get involved there. As I mentioned, now we're on Lombard, Advantage, Pacific Life, and Prudential 
is kind of the the main four that that were on their platforms. But there was a process, and I think that's gotten has it gotten easier, Dave. Maybe you can speak to that. It's certainly gotten more, I would say, formalized, especially as the the carrier adoption of SMA solutions has grown. And so when we engage with an RIA to build an SMA program, there's some initial lift there. There's an upfront due diligence that we spearhead completes on the RIA. It's primarily operational in nature. So it's asking for things like forms, ADVs, corporate documents, bios on key individuals. There's a standardized DDQ that they'll complete. And so the RIA will submit all that material to us for our initial review. And then once that file is populated, we'll save that file and then we'll draft all like legal documentation associated with the SMA program in coordination with the RIA. And then once we have the, the due diligence file and the legal docs, then when there's we're aware of a, an initial client SMA opportunity with a carrier, then we'll submit that as a program or a package to the carrier. And then likewise, they'll conduct their own review. And as Kevin, as you alluded to, many of the carriers use outside, you know, consultants, the Mercers, the Alburns of the world to complete that. And from, from start to finish ballpark, ballpark about three months to complete that, assuming everyone's, you know, moving in lockstep and, you know, there's an, there's an end goal, meaning there's a client policy funding where these dollars, you know, are intended to invest. And I think one key point to bring up there too is there's no cost to do that, right, Dave? It's just um, you've got to have an active client opportunity to actually get the file submitted to the carrier. That's right. Um, you'll see lack of artwork behind me. Um, we charge nothing upfront to build programs with RIAs. We purely charge basis points on assets. What the asset once the SMA program is launched, so we charge ten basis points on the first fifty million of AUM across the RIAs program. And then that drops to eight basis points at 50 million and then six basis points at 150. So let's talk for a minute about, uh, again, don't want to beat a dead horse, but but the investor control diversification issues within an SMA. So with an IDF, it's deemed to have been satisfied by the structure itself. But with an SMA, again, because that's the one thing that can blow this, this whole thing up, we got to be super careful about investor control and, and diversification. So how do you guys make sure that that is effectuated, Dave? And then and then on to Kevin. Have you guys had any issues with that? Have you had any pushback from clients? Have you guys had any frustrations with that? Stuff like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak from, from the administrator's perspective. Technically, when that SMA is funded, the sub-advisor has 364 days to scale into a diversified portfolio. So you don't have to be fully diversified on day one, which can be especially pertinent if you're building out an allocation, let's say, to private investments, private credit, private equity, et cetera, which may not you know, call down capital immediately up front. Um, but we monitor every SMA that we administer. And then likewise, we have reporting that we deliver to the carrier showing that you know, each individual SMA is properly diversified. And likewise, we run checks anytime that you know, Prevenio submits an investment to us to effectuate, we likewise run a test and make sure that we're not running a follow of diversification limits. So it, it's not possible, I would say, to like accidentally screw it up because of all the checks and balances. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Even on the even on the liquid markets component, we're still monitoring the liquid markets portion of the portfolio. And you know, if, if anything's off, we we step in and instruct the sub advisor to correct the allocation. Kevin, to you, what as you've administered both sides of the you know the IDF and the SMA, have you guys had any issues? Again, you mentioned the diversification thing with with Lombard, but any any issues on the investor control piece with with your clients pushing back and saying, "Yeah, I don't like this," or "This has been a problem for me," or whatever. Well, I think that um, I mean we have as 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 it's related to say like prospects, like some larger family offices that. We've got a good entree in. Once we get there, the, the CIO just has a tough time giving us, you know, discretion. And 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 once again, that might be, you know, just from experience, you know, him him trying to kind of hold on, him or her trying to hold on to a seat. Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 that's okay. You know, we're making progress with some of them. Uh, but you know, as it relates to our best practices and as a fiduciary for for our clients. It is a fine line, right? It's it's we've got a non-discretionary business that's 
the bulk of our business. And so as we take our clients through discovery, we have a pretty stringent discovery process as we onboard clients. We obviously build out, you know, a robust investment policy statement. And so there's some things that we've been working on internally to uh, really make it clear in the investment, the, the master investment policy statement, and then creating an investment policy statement specifically on the discretionary side for, you know, for the SMA. Um, and, you know, what you're trying to avoid is you're trying to you're trying to have more high level conversations about, you know, asset allocation and diversification. Um, and naturally, it makes sense for a lot of these tax inefficient strategies to end up in the SMA. You know, so, you know, we have investment memos that we that, that, that will produce. I mean, in, in our opinion, there's no reason why you can't educate a client on a strategy inside of a private private credit portfolio, you know, knowing that we're ultimately making the decision whether or not that strategy is going to be is going to be put into the SMA. I think what they're trying to avoid is is having a client call up and say, yeah, I want my money to go on XYZ manager and, you know, trying to like dictate what the, you know, what the actual underlying investments are going to look like. And even further than that, back when this all started, you know, there was conversation around, you know, uh, GPs of hedge funds that wanted to put their own strategies inside of PPLI. And that, that's just a no-no, right? And then taking it a step further, which we haven't we haven't done, but putting business interests, you know, inside of these structures, and um, but but I think someone someone mentioned earlier about the the Weber case. I mean, if you if you if you look at because once again, this is not like an SEC issue. This is an IRS issue, right? And what you don't want to have happen is you you know you've got this great SMA you built out, you're compounding compounding, and all of a sudden the client gets audited. And then they identify, you know, you pierce the investor control and now you've got a big ass task, you know, a big tax is due. So. Yeah, that's that's for sure. The uh, the one thing we want to we want to prevent. Right. Yeah. Um, Anything else, Frank, on, on this page? We've got a list on the next page of. of yeah, some of I the mean, we're obviously touching upon a lot of stuff that we're going to that are on the next pages. So I think we're just going to sort of continue to go into a deeper dive into some of the real specifics of what Dave and, and Kevin were talking about. Yeah, here, here's a list of some of the SMA managers uh, that, that we work with. It's actually not an exhaustive list or some names I see missing here, but it, this is becoming more and more common. Um, I would say, especially with the independent, the large independent RIAs, banks and trust companies across the U.S., multifamily offices as well, where, you know, if you're north of a billion dollars, seeing a very, um, I don't know if it's a resurgence, but it's certainly an increase in awareness of what's going on uh, in the private placement space. Uh, we're getting some inbound stuff, which is which is actually really nice as well. Um Next one's funding. Frank, you want to take this and or maybe yeah, Frank, you take yeah. this and we can we can hand it off to Dave too for additional. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So so what this is th this page is demonstrating is SMA and IDF funding minimums. But I think even before we get to this page, Dave, could you talk a little bit about, and again, this is also on subsequent pages, but when an, when a firm like Kevin's is thinking about creating either an IDF or an SMA program, what type of asset commitment are the various carriers looking for uh, from that wealth advisor to get a program actually off the ground? Sure. Um, so to create an IDF, I would argue for efficiency purposes and just scale of launching a new product, you really need 10 million or more of day one capital seeding an IDF, a commingled fund vehicle. At that size, you have some economies of scale where the, the embedded costs of the fund structure itself are not overly dilutive. And also at that, that $10 million figure, you know, it's worthwhile to an insurance company to onboard and approve the IDF onto their platform. Um, with an SMA program, we can create and launch an SMA program for an RIA with as little as 5 million of, of committed premiums on an initial client case. And then once, once that SMA program is approved with a carrier, 
oftentimes we have additional flexibility. You know, the carrier will allow for SMAs smaller than 5 million for future opportunities, as you can see on this graph. Um, every carrier is, is different in what their appetite is to approve a new SMA program. For carriers like Prudential or Investors Preferred, you know, they'll launch, they'll approve a, a brand new SMA program for 5 million or more committed premiums. Carriers like Excellus, they tend to they tend to like to see a business plan from the RIA where that RIA can can steer, call it 20 to 25 million in new premiums over the course of that initial year. And so part of our job as administrator is when we're building the SMA program with the RIA, kind of understand where this fits in their overall business, how, how high of a priority is this, how much do they sort of practically think they can drive towards their program, and then we can help them select in the appropriate carrier based off of that. Um, right. I'd also add just as, as a bare minimum, the RIA needs to be SEC registered, you know, minimum AUM, it's recommended 500 million to a billion or more of discretionary assets. Cause likewise, the carriers want to, they want to approve SMA programs where they see potential there, where, you know, it's not just a single opportunity, but you know, hopefully both, both the RIA and they can be successful in you know, expanding that SMA program. Right. And, and right. So, th so this page is really laying out what are the requirements from the carriers once that program is off the ground. Right. So we're looking at and, and again, these are aggregate numbers, total funding per contract over up to four years. So crew for an SMA program, they're still they're going to have that five million dollar requirement. Uh, the PPVA, I mean, the IDF is a million dollars. Excellus, which was formerly Lombard, so people may be familiar with that name. They are now rebranded Excellus. They'll do an SMA on the PPLI side, right, for a million dollars. On the IDF side, as low as $500,000, investor preferred, $2 million SMA commitment or a million dollar uh, IDF commitment. Um what about Dave? Real quick, just to touch upon one uh, one thing you mentioned, you talked about SCC registered. What about trust companies? Um, trust companies, the the carrier will look to the overall size of the trust company and and sort of assess it on a business case. Yep. Okay. Yeah. You know, one one thing I'll add here. Sorry, Frank. I mean to cut you. No, off. no. Go ahead, Ben. Um, is while we're showing a four year funding schedule down here, um, just just. To be clear, you you can fund PPLI policies shorter than four or more than four. A lot of people, I've shown this slide to some other folks, and they're like, wait, can't you do like a five-year, six-year funding? Yeah, you can. We're just talking about, again, kind of the, the initial funding pattern uh, to, to get an SMA started at, at a particular carrier, our new new policy. Um, and the other thing I was going to say, too, is for, for um, asset managers that don't qualify for their own SMA program, there are a number of firms um, like Kevin's and Kevin, I don't know if you've done a JV before with another firm where they wanted access to PPLI, but they they didn't want to go through that heavy lift of getting approved. Uh, but there are a couple of firms that we know that 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 could partner or would be willing to partner, and maybe you guys would if even if you haven't. Where again, you 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 kind of co you go in there together, you charge the AUM, you split the fee, but they're able to kind of piggyback off of what you've already built. Yeah, yeah, we've got. One group here locally that we've done that with, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, definitely worth a conversation. Yeah, that'd, that'd be a way to kind of, to your point, like dip dip your toes in the water to understand kind of what it is, and maybe as you're as you're scaling and as you're growing your own firm, again, that might provide the the lift that you need to kind of get get your you know get your toe hold in the space, so to speak. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, point. I mean, I would just add to it. I mean, if you're, you know, if you're a independent RIA out there or just even an you know an investment manager in itself and you're not having these conversations with your clients somebody else is going to be having those conversations That's you know right. and it just for us it worked pretty well because and I always say this like why is this industry not a lot larger than it is it's and, and Ben will laugh but a lot of the insurance producers don't like to sell PPLI or PPVA because there's no large commissions like traditional and retail insurance. And then a lot of the investment advisors, when insurance topic comes up, their clients want to run from the hills and 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 investment professionals just don't even want to go there. Yeah. So for, for Ben and I, it was a it was a natural because he understood the investment side of the business. You know, my background was more involved in the planning and the insurance side of the business. 
and kind of marrying that together, I think it, it gave us a little bit of a competitive advantage moving forward. But, you know, I tell family offices, I'll tell other, you know, RIAs that you've got to be having these conversations with your clients, especially if they're investing in alternative strategies. And I would even argue that we have a family up north that has been sitting on embedded gains, you know, for, for a number of years and doesn't want to sell because they don't want to pay the taxes. You know, and his his investment advisor that's running his traditionals could have set up an SMA inside of our PPLI. We, we were open to that. We had that conversation. And he wouldn't be making that decision today, right? Where you see the volatility the volatility in the in the in the public markets, right? And so yeah, I think it's 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 definitely a conversation that should be had with with your families. Yeah, we, you and I have even had the conversation, Kevin, that that at a certain level, it's it's almost malpractice to not bring it up at some point in the client engagement, right? And that's that's not to throw stones, but that's to say it's it. This is a real, um, a lot of the barriers to getting this stuff done have, have gone away, and it's a, it's a real option that that clients need to be aware of. Yeah, I mean, even just like on the big the big picture side of things, like millennium and Gallup, like you'll show up at a family office and, you know, you'll get, you'll get some visibility on, on their asset allocation, their portfolio. And I'm looking at the CIO and I'm like, why are you owning Gallup and millennium in a taxable account? Right. Right. I mean, and he's like, what do you mean? Right. And that, and that segues into that conversation. And then all of a sudden you see all these hedge funds, you know, you, you know, and it's hard, right. Because you, you know, it's, it's hard to redeem out of those strategies and then go reallocate just because the the illiquidity, but you know you can set a plan in place, you know, especially for for new investments, if you're going to be investing in those types of strategies to to try to get them inside these structures. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, so we've got six minutes left, um, and in the time we got left, we had a couple of just placeholder slides here. Uh, Kevin, this was for you, the wealth manager perspective. Um, you know, making sure we hit all of this stuff. I think we talked about onboarding, custody, you know, I just preferred custodian, investor control, reporting, all that. In, anything else that, that we've not hit on that you want to mention or you want to talk about from an experience perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I just said the, the, the onboarding is, is um, you know, as I said, all, you know, alternatives are complex. And, you know, so so the, I think, it's made it a lot easier, you know, for, for the SMAs, um, as we stated, as it relates to, you know, Dave, Dave and team doing sub docs, um, you know, uh, in, you know, we talked about the investor control, I'd say reporting, reporting for us, you know, we use, we use Adapar and, and, um, you know, we are looking at separating separating that out of uh, of kind of their primary statement, right? Once again, doing doing a kind of another taking another step to try to protect that whole investor control, right? Because you've got the non discretionary portfolio and the taxable account essentially, and then you've got a dis discretionary as well. So we, we've done a, we've done a few things where it's created a little bit more work, um, but I think it's probably the right thing to do. Um, yeah, then just, you, you know, private investments. I mean, I, as I said, we, we've we we've been pretty conservative. I think I, if you're alluding to this, we've, we've just kind of stayed the course. I mean, our, our niche is, is really, you're not going to see a lot of large managers uh, inside of our SMAs. We're, we're trying to find, you know, smaller, more capacity constrained niche like strategies um, to where we think that's an edge, you know, versus in, in our opinion, you know, really, really need to hire us to go, you know, invest, invest with a lot of the big boys on the alternative side of things. I mean, a lot of them have their own, their own IDFs. Dave, can you, can you talk for a minute on the reporting side? Th this comes up a lot in my conversations with wealth managers. Can you talk about best practices as to what a wealth manager should do on the reporting side, both in real time, and then what access does the client have 
to actually knowing and when can they know what are what am I invested in other than just seeing a bottom line number at the end of the day of total value? Sure. Um, so the client will always, as policy owner, the client will always receive reporting from the insurance company. And depending on the carrier, some carriers issue statements monthly, some issue them quarter, quarterly. Um, by and large, that reporting is relatively limited, but it will provide an updated value of the client's account balance inside their policy. If they're invested in IDFs, it'll show the value and performance of each underlying IDF. Um, with separate managed accounts, typically the carrier will just you know, state the value of that account. Um, separately, if the RIA would like to deliver more itemized reporting to the client on you know, the constellation of investments held inside that SMA, they can do so using their own reporting. That being said, best practice is to deliver that 30 days after either end of month or end of quarter, just to eliminate any preponderance of investor control violation or you know, client having any advanced knowledge of, of those investments being made. Um, likewise, you know, the client can the client can also receive receive a, a day opening account balance or a day ending account balance for their policy account. That's important for some clients, especially when they initially fund a contract. You know, they may be they may be nervous, hey, where are these dollars today? And so the advisor can can share that info with them as well. Do you find that most uh, most well about 45, 45 days in arrears? Yeah, 45. So 45, 40, yeah, 45 days after quarter end. Yep, is, is really when our statements are coming out. Yeah, and especially given that you guys allocate to alternatives, that's probably when you're getting reporting from some of your managers. So exactly, and, sometimes and you, sometimes sixty. Dave, mo most wealth managers do customize their own reporting, albeit in a, in a delayed fashion, or are yeah, are relying on the insurance companies for that reporting. No, like like most advisors will be listed as an interested party with the, with the policy, so that when the carrier delivers that reporting to the client, advisor will see that statement as well. But most advisors will build you know, reporting for the SMA into their standard deliverable reporting that they're they're showing to clients. So you know the SMA will just be you know an additional page or component of the total reporting package that they send the client. Got it. Well, we're, we're at the end of our time here. Um, the last slide here is just a reminder uh, of the next deep dive that we've got at the end of May. You see that on your screen there, you can scan that QR code to register for that. Click the link when we send you the materials, you can register new a new feature, by the way, when you register. Uh, the confirmation is sent via a, uh, a calendar invite. So when you register, it'll show up around your calendar and you won't miss it going forward. Uh, and then we, we'll, we'll take the summer off for deep dives. We'll come back and do four more in the fall. Uh, a shout out to Kevin for the idea for deep dive number four. Uh, it's, his, it's his case study that we're going to be talking about where we're going to use PPLI and PPVA, but mostly PPLI for immediate income. And he was talking about uh, some of these asset managers that, that are you know credit funds and whatever else where clients are actually spending those dollars. It's a great place to locate those in PPLI. They get a higher after-tax income or after-policy charge income and it creates better client outcomes all the way. So we've had some great conversations around that. It's, it's a new use case for PPLI that we've not seen in the market. And I think a lot of you probably haven't either. So we encourage you to, to sign up for that. Uh, all contact information for everybody is on the next page. So feel free to reach out to us, Dave, Kevin, whatever. And then all the way in the appendix, uh, we have our tax treatments of both uh, products and then all of the IDFs and VITs that are available at each carrier. So um, I think that's it. Although I did see one Q and A pop up. I might as well. I was about to answer it, but why don't we go, read go, it? Go ahead, Frank. You answer it. So, uh, Dave, how about uh, can you convert a VUL policy with a three million dollar surrender value to a PPP a PPLI? So I assume by convert that means can I ten thirty five a VUL a traditional VUL into a PPLI? Uh, and the answer would be yes. Uh, would this qualify for an SMA or an IDF? And if an IDF, where are the funds held? So would it qualify for an SMA or IDF? Yes, you hit on it. This this would be a you know, potential 1035 opportunity to PPLI. Um, if the RIA has an existing SMA program, this could slot in under that program as a new SMA. If they don't have an existing SMA program, three millions 
not large enough to launch a program, but the client could allocate to IDFs that are offered by the carrier. So as part of the 1035 exchange, those dollars would transfer from the original issuing insurance company over to the PPLI carrier. And then those dollars would be held in that segregated account of the PPLI carrier. And then the policy owner could direct those into IDFs off of the carrier's investment menu. Right, or VITs and, but essentially, with with respect to that question, right, the, the funds are being held at the carrier in that particular example, going the IDF or VIT route. That's right. The Schwab per, you know, fidelity custodian is not implicated in that particular example. Not, no, not unless they're, the RIA is an existing SMA program. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's it. Dave, Kevin, thanks for your time, your expertise. And, thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. I hope this was helpful to all of our attendees. We've recorded this. We'll send it around for everybody. And until uh, until next time, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Ben. Yes. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you guys. Everybody.